Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to PerpetualChessPod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Carlson Neiman bonus pod discussing this ongoing controversy, providing new angles basically every day. And I'm trying to bring in a rotating cast of intelligent, uh, even minded people to discuss this controversy. And joining us this time is another return guest. He is a FIDE master, a data scientist, a former professional poker player. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Evaluate Like a Grandmaster, alongside fellow friend of the pod, Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. He is a chess blogger. He writes for uh, a blog on Substack called Zwischenzug that is a must read. Uh, it's free to subscribe. Highly recommend it as I have before. And on Monday, he released a measured look at the statistical evidence of whether or not Hans Niemann cheated with his own research. Uh, that post was called Did, Hi- Did Hans Niemann Cheat? And it kind of went viral. So we'll discuss that a bit. But on Tuesday, we're recording this Wednesday morning, by the way, uh, chess.com released their much anticipated statement slash report. Um, it was uh, billed as a 72-page report. It's uh, 20 pages of prose and 52 pages of graphs, but uh, detailing all of the decisions they made for better or for worse, um, and uh, getting into a lot of details of previously unknown factors about uh, these recent uh, past weeks. So there's tons to discuss from it. We'll be running down the highlights and then jumping into a more general conversation. But first, let's welcome Nate Solon back to the show. Good morning, Nate. Good morning. Hey, Ben. Great to be here. Um, yeah, things are moving so fast. It's hard. It's hard to keep up. Yeah, you wrote this amazing post. I felt like it was getting a lot of traction. Um, and now it's getting, it'll probably be dwarfed, even though I think it's as relevant as ever. Yeah, it was, so so like, like we discussed, I have a three-month-old, but I was, I was really rushing to, I knew I had to get this thing out before Chess.com dropped their report and the whole narrative changed again. But uh, yeah, it seemed like people found some value in it. So, so that was nice. Yeah. And as we record this Wednesday morning, the U.S. championship is starting. The European Club Cup is ongoing. So I hope that chess soon can take center stage. And I have a feeling, you know, I could be proven wrong, but I have a feeling the announcements are going to slow down. We've we've heard from everyone. Um, I I would st- I still think Magnus has a lot of explaining to do personally, Um but that doesn't mean we're going to hear from him. So I suspect that uh, things will slow down and we'll start to focus on chess and sort of start to focus on how to process uh, everything that's happened and how we move forward from here. Um, But we'll save the discussion for a few minutes later. I wanted to get into the highlights of the chess.com report. I've got listeners. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Add one thing really quick, Ben. So the, you you pointed out the U S championship is starting. Um, Most people probably know this, but of course, Hans is in that tournament. Yes. Round one today, Hans is playing. So that's another crazy angle to this. Yeah, it should be fascinating. And and yeah, I'm I'm interested to see how it goes. I mean, I think it must have been extremely difficult to play after round three in the Sinkfield Cup. Now he's had a bit of time to process, but it's still got to be tough to compete at an elite level um, under these conditions. And uh, as I talked about in uh, Tuesday's episode with uh, FM Dennis Monacrucis, it's it's basically a super tournament. Aronian, So, Caruana, um, Dominguez. So, uh, it, yeah, it'll be fascinating to see how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. So to get to the chess.com story. Um, so to me, the leads are they explain their actions. Um they provide a clear proof that Hans Niemann lied um, in his famous uh, post-game press conference. He lied about the extent of his cheating uh, and the frequency of his cheating um, in uh, in that interview. Uh, they provided, to my mind, extremely credible evidence. It was backed by uh, Dr. Regan's own analysis, a uh, third party, um, that, that Hans misled them 
but big but uh he has not they do not allege that he has cheated in any form since 2020 um he has a new online account that was formed shortly after um he was banned for his previous transgressions and that one has maintained a rating of over 2900 blitz um over 400 games in the last year um and they talk a lot about his over the board play they kind of talk on both sides about his over the board play but they do have a bottom line um let's see i have a quote here Despite the public speculation on these questions, in our view, there is no direct evidence that Hans cheated at the sem September 4th, 2022 game with Magnus or that he has cheated in other OTB games in the past. Uh, they go on to still <laughs> raise some suspicion despite exonerating him. But I mean, such is the nature of uh, living in an, a world with incomplete information. I somewhat understand that. Um, and there's a few key points, but Nate, I don't want to monopolize <laughs> the conversation. Do you have anything to add so far? Yeah. So um, as, as far as probably probably the biggest concrete information they reveal is the extent of um, the the online cheating, which is, you know, it's significantly more than than Hans admitted to. And the the distinction between he, one of one of his main claims was he never cheated in events with prize money. They contradict that. Um, when, when I released my own subjective probabilities the morning before this came out, I was at uh, seventy five percent that he had cheated online more than he admitted to, which was perhaps low. I would say when Chess dot com released their previous statement saying Hans had cheated more than than he said online, but not giving details, I probably would have been at ninety five percent plus just. Because I know historically chess.com does not like to talk about these cheating things publicly. They like to keep it in-house with these private negotiations. Um, so I just thought, why would they they come out publicly with this unless they really had the goods? But then as it was kind of dragging out and, and they weren't coming out with anything, I was getting cold feet a little bit. But I think, you know, I think this report pushes it up close to, you know, 99% plus because it's just... I mean, unless they fabricated the entire report, which would be insane, you know, which they they didn't do. Um, yeah, it certainly looks like he did cheat on chess.com more than he admitted to. Um, more in insignificant ways, but but at the same time, as you say, not since 2022, which which again raises the question of the timing. 2020, um, right? 2020, excuse me. Um, so of course he was up until the Sinkfield Cup. He was still allowed to play on chess.com and then uh his his account was abruptly closed so they they address this in in the report although it's kind of hard to address if they if they knew this guy was a, a huge cheater why was he still playing on the site right yeah so i'll read part of their statement about why they banned hans rebanned hans in the middle of the sinkfield cup because um to me, that that was an eyebrow raising decision. Um, so this is what they write. Uh, we fully understand the confusion and criticism among many in the chess community about our decision to ban Hans from our platform and rescind his invitation to the chess.com global championship shortly after his match with Magnus at the Singfield Cup, particularly if we did not have evidence proving he cheated o OTB. The truth is there was no perfect way to make these decisions at the time, and we did the best we could working with the information and the short timeline we had. Additionally, we felt that simply that uninviting him to the CGC but allowing him continued access to chess.com to compete in other events could result in more confusion. And we wanted to take some time to review the situation and ultimately have a private conversation with Hans. We did not anticipate that he would make it a public conversation. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> your reaction to that, Nate? Yeah, I think, I mean, I see where they're coming from. I think um, it does make sense from their side, it's kind of, it's, it's the best explanation they can give. I still, um, it's not completely satisfying to me, but, but it does, it does make sense. Basically this, you know, Magnus withdrawing from the tournament created a massive stink, just put this whole situation in the public eye and, um, they felt like they, they had to react to it. So yeah, yeah and I, I get it, but I still, don't, I still don't love that. 
he was a, allowed to play on chess.com. Nothing really changed as far as, you know, certainly as, as far as the evidence um, that he cheated online and clearly Magnus was upset, but, but Magnus is, has still not, you know, over a month later, I believe not really presented any concrete evidence that, that Hans cheated in that game. So to me, the sort of the, the concrete evidence didn't really change. Yeah. Well said. I agree. Um, you know, if you read the whole report, which obviously we did, they talk a lot about sort of the compressed timeline because they had a firm starting date for the chess.com global championship uh, and they needed the field confirmed. They needed to put out their promotional materials. Um, <clears throat> and suddenly they've got, they mentioned, they say they weren't, they didn't have direct communication with Magnus or his camp, but they also say they had like super GMs in their ear. Um, you know, it felt like information was emerging at that time. And certainly if you, if you go back to those days, right when the r report um, came out, it was a very common interpretation, like, you know, Magnus knows something big. Um, so I personally, I have other, so I have some some qualms with this report, but, you know, people make mistakes and they more or less admitted that they didn't handle this perfectly. Um, so like, you know, w I think that's, that's admirable under the circumstances. I do think the way they handled it was a mistake. But again, uh, we all make mistakes. Certainly, Hans has made some big mistakes. Um, so I overall found that uh, reasonably satisfactory under the circumstances. It, um, it also seems like part of the story here, speaking of the them receiving pressure from other GMs, as other GMs have weighed in on this, it seems like a lot of them are suspicious of Hans. Like there's some kind of feeling in the G, you know, the grandmaster community, it seems like that Hans, Hans is suspect. And then what's hard for me to tell, not really being part of that community is, is there some sort of ground truth, some sort of evidence? Do they all know something we don't? Or is it more a case of confirmation bias? And once someone has that light of suspicion cast on them, you find more and more reasons to doubt them. Uh, so that's, I think that's, that's a tough thing to unravel without, without knowing exactly what's happening in these discussions. Yeah, I agree. There, there's widespread suspicion of Hans and yeah, much more. They, even in their report, they share some email communications between, uh, chief chess, chess officer, Danny Wrench of chess.com and Hans. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it was in the air for sure. And, and as I've mentioned before, you know, I interviewed Hans in, uh, March, and I didn't, I didn't know about those allegations. Um, so yeah. um, it, it also seems that there was uh, a lot of pent up frustration and anger from a lot of grandmasters that cheating was a serious problem and, and wasn't being addressed properly. And it, it seems like that's all kind of landed on Hans fairly or not. Yeah. I, I've got a lot to say about that, but <laughs> let's, uh, let's get through the report. Um, to me, the only other major thing to share is is the conclusion. Um, so, and again, they go through lots of data about his his rapid rise, and you know, to me, um, I'm not sure how how relevant that is from uh, a chess site. Um, what should be an ana analytically like what he did on their site driven perspective. But anyway, the conclusion that they say is we understand that the events of the last few weeks have been disappointing for many chess fans, though we have tried to always act in line with our mission while doing our best to protect the integrity of the game. We recognize as we analyzed and replayed the rapid series of events that took place that we could have made several better moves. And we hope to have learned a lot in this process. Our hope is that this report will be a first step toward clearing up any confusion as to why we took certain steps in the wake of the September 4th, 2022 Carlson versus Neiman match uh, at the 2022 Sinkfield Cup. So, yeah, lots to discuss. And we'll also get into Nate's post to sort of set the stage. Uh, but first, we are going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. And then we will be right back to dig deeper into uh, this this huge, uh, huge report with lots to discuss. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. Of course, Chessable uses space repetition to help you learn opening sequences, tactical patterns, um, specific end games, whatever it may be that you need to work on on your game. Uh, some of their latest courses include 
Understanding Chess Openings Part 3 by none other than Big Vladdy, former world champion Grandmaster Vladimir Kramnik, sharing his lifetime of expertise on uh, how to respond to various E4 possibilities. So be sure to check that out. And they have a, a free preview for Chessable Pro members. So please just remember to make it part of your routine to go to chessable.com and check out uh, all of their new offerings, which are available both for free and for purchase. And we are back. And as I said, we've got so much um, to dissect from that report. But before we do that, Nate, uh, you wrote, I know you've been researching this for days. You publish um, generally on Saturdays. I always look forward to reading your posts on the, the Zwischen Zook blog. And for this one, you were doing so much research that it came a bit late. Um, again, you're being a new dad. I, I'm, I'm impressed that you're even able to, to keep producing this content. But anyway, for listeners who did not see it, could you briefly summarize uh, this uh, this post called Did Hans Neiman Cheat? Yeah, for sure. Um, so basically where this came from was it, it seemed like it seemed to me that the statistical, a particular statistical case that he cheated had really become central to, to the whole narrative around this controversy, uh, which was the idea that he had a 100% engine correlation score on this, this particular feature uh, in chess base. And, uh, you know, it was when I posted on Twitter about anything about chess, people were responding with, you know, even unrelated things like multiple people were responding like, Oh, what about these perfect games? What about this accuracy? Um, you know, it was picked up by Hikaru. It was even there's, there's this New York times report that said something about, his unbelievable accuracy. I, I don't know if they were referring to that, but but it seemed like there was, it had really become part of the narrative that it was a st- sort of a statistical fact that was established that he had this unbelievable, perfect accuracy. And basically, um, when I looked into where, how, how that analysis was done, I just, it, it didn't really hold up for me. Um, so, so in terms of the details, um, it was, it was, um, this chess based feature called um yeah let's check and there's an engine correlation score i don't i don't want to spend too much time on this because i know we were eager to get into the chess.com report so i don't um, yeah and we did discuss it with uh grandmaster david smeridan last Mm -hmm. week i think uh a lot of listeners will will be aware of that story but for those who are not i certainly encourage them to to dig deeper but but the bottom line is nate did his own research and shared the data and instead of using engine matching you use the more typical um, Lee Chess algorithm of uh, of Senapon loss, and we want to be clear that no no data set is perfect. Um, but anyway, Nate, I'll let you uh, yeah, pick just, up the thread from here. Just just to say really briefly that my issue with using the chess base um, engine correlation was that 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 let's check feature is that's a feature really for crowdsourcing analysis. Um, it it works by users can upload engine analysis they've done and then other users can access it. So, um, they, uh, uh, it's, it's not really for cheating detection. It's for, so people don't have to analyze the same position on their computer over and over again, which makes sense. The issue is that for me, if you're going to do, um, an an analysis comparing multiple players, you have to do the same thing for every player. That's really the core of it. And, because this relies on users uploading their data, which can basically be any, you know, anyone can can upload any analysis more or less, there can't be any consistency. Different players, different games have um, different data and it changes. So when you look at that, um, the, the Hans 100% game depended on certain engine analysis being uploaded that wasn't necessarily uploaded for different players. It's actually since changed um, as people have uploaded um, different analysis. Some of, you know, I just spot checked one of those hundred percent games. Now it's saying 70%. So to me, if it can change that much just by random users uploading stuff, you can't really use that for a cheating detection analysis. Um, and I do, I do want to admit, I got one thing wrong there. I, I had said in the report that, all the the analyses that are uploaded are still there. It's actually um, someone pointed out. It's actually a top three, so that is a difference in the details. But if anything, that kind of underscores the core of the problem here, which is that 
it's it's a feature that relies on random users uploading stuff. There's no consistency. It can change. It can be manipulated. Um, so for that reason, um, not, not really suitable for, for a cheating detection analysis. Um, and I, yeah, and what I did was I just looked at, to me, what would be an obvious first step, the sent upon loss, which is just how much the player's moves um, differ from the engine top move, how, mu how much they lost by deviating from the most accurate lines, essentially. And basically, when you look at that, um, Hans is more or less where you'd expect based on his rating, his tournament results, and so on. And that's definitely not um, an end-all, be-all analysis. It's more of a sort of quick back-of-the-envelope sanity check, but it's a starting point that at least, you know, I think that there's, there's like a very widespread perception that if you looked at Hans's accuracy, it just, it would just jump off the page at you that it was, you know, insane and impossible. And I really don't think that was the case at all. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Just once again, want to reiterate that as David Smerdin said last week, and as you uh, highlighted in your blog post, Chessbase very specifically says that this is not to be used for cheat detection. So I have to be honest, it really bothers me that the whole world ran wild with this particular method of air quotes, uh, cheat detection. Um, and that kind of segues back into the chess.com report because, um, again, I felt like they did a reasonable job under the circumstances of accounting for the decisions that they took, um, with regard to rebanning Hans, but they also provided a lot of data, um, kind of again, pointing in both directions, but with again, the top line that there's no evidence that Hans cheated. So they looked at the rise of different prodigies and provided kind of scatter point graphs about that. They, But more importantly, they applied their algorithm to tournament games, Hans's tournament games. And they said that some of the, um, some of the online uh, videos that have been shown using Let's Check, er, quote, did not meet their standards. Um, so Again, even chess.com with what Hans and many others have concluded is the best cheat detection in the world. Um, they they stated that they don't find this let's check to be useful. Um, and in terms of what they did find or did say in the report, they again, bottom line, they said there's there's no evidence of cheating, but they did list six tournaments that they said um, if if you were going to investigate anything, I guess you would look at these six tournaments. What did you think of that whole, uh, um, I don't know what to call it, aside or topic in the report, Nate? To, yeah, to me, um, may, maybe one of the biggest parts of the story of this report is not even what they said about Hans's OTB track record, but that they talked about it at all and, you know, and quite extensively, right? So they, they announced a 72 page report. It's really 20 pages uh, of the report proper with 50 some pages of uh, appendix and figures and stuff. But, but of those 20 pages, about half of it is uh, this OTB analysis. And it, as they say in the, in the report, they're not really in the business of OTB chess. Uh, they don't run any OTB events. Um, historically, they have not, analyzed um they have not analyzed the fairness of any otb events so it's 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 interesting I, I was a little unclear why this and especially given that they didn't really reach any conclusions apart from well there's some unusual things about his, his how quick his rises but ultimately nothing you could say for sure um so i mean one one thing that i guess one thing that i would say is when you when you look at Ken Regan, who's who's widely considered the the leading expert in this cheat detection, he does his analysis on Hans and doesn't come up with anything over the board. Um, and you look at Chess.com, who has they have the resources to have a data site, you know, a team of very very well trained people who who know how to look at data, and they go through it, and neither of them really finds anything. Uh, at, at least that you can make a conclusion on it doesn't it doesn't prove that Hans did not cheat but I would say it says pretty strongly that he didn't he didn't cheat in an obvious way you know if both if both of these groups don't find anything yeah 
Um, and they, they list the six tournaments to the extent that we're going to continue to have amateur detectives. Um, I would encourage people to, I don't know, talk to people that played him in those tournaments. I've actually tried to talk to a few people. Uh, most people don't want to go on the record. Um, about it. I think that they just feel like it's a lose lose. I mean, you certainly uh, you would have to tread very lightly if you're going to accuse someone of cheating. But um, Hans doesn't seem to be that well liked in the uh, Grandmaster community. So I don't think anyone's all that eager to uh, exonerate him either. But anyway, these six tournaments that they mention are the Philadelphia International way back in 2016, the Windsor NAYCC under 18 in 2016. The Charlotte Fall GM in 2020, that's the one where uh, we've discussed the Abimanyu Mishra game previously. The 49th World Open, which he won in 2021. The 14th Philadelphia International, which he, uh, I don't know, sorry, I don't know if he won that one also in June of 2021. And the uh, Capablanca, Capablanca Memorial in Cuba in April of uh, 2022. But this is a list of 30 tournaments. And they just pick six, you know, and there's a couple of them are like two events in a row, but basically they're just kind of scattered all over the place. Um, so it would be an unusual, I mean, they're not alleging he cheated all the time and it would be in these specific tournaments. Again, I've uh, not to belabor this, but I did talk to Peter about the Charlotte one, Peter Giannatos and uh, their security is very good. I, I will admit that the Philadelphia tournaments, the continental chess tournaments, um, I, I haven't been overly impressed with their security. Um, so, but anyway, I mean, I feel like we need less amateur data uh, analysis and we need concrete physical evidence if there is any, which I'm, I've been skeptical of and this report made me more skeptical of. Yeah, that's, that's another interesting part of all this. Um, as, as far as I know, no one has really suggested any mechanism by which he would have cheated in these over the, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's impossible. I know there are devices, um, but apart from this anal beads thing, which I think was a joke, there doesn't seem to have been like really any serious suggestion as to how he would have done this. Yeah. Um, in these big open tournaments, I could see a signaling system. What, one other thing is, I, I don't know if you know this, I, I've actually played um, Hansa over the board. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, I, I played him years ago in um, uh, an IM Norm tournament in Boston. Um, and we had a, it was kind of a messy back and forth game. I don't think either of us played particularly well. I kind of lost, made the last mistake and he ended up winning. But, uh, you know, it, was, it, it is interesting to me because we had, um, like we did a postmortem. And what, what part of the story with Hans has been that the analysis, the lines he's giving in these interviews are kind of scrambled and people are saying, okay, that's evidence that, um, that, that he's not such a strong player, but, uh, this is years and years ago. But when I, when I played him, um, what I was actually most impressed by was his analysis in the postmortem. Um, you know, like I say, he didn't, he didn't play especially well during that particular game, but, um, we did a postmortem and he was showing a lot of lines, you know, in that context of, just one, just the two of us looking over the game. Um, you know, he didn't say the chess speaks for itself. Or he, there, there wasn't this. He, he wasn't in this sort of abrasive mode. He, you know, we were just looking over the game like you normally do. And um, you know, I came away feeling with like this guy is really, really talented. Um, it would, you know, he had seen a lot of impressive stuff during the game. Yeah, uh, your fellow. Now you're a former Massachusetts resident, but your fellow. Uh, Massachusetts resident, I am David Vigorito, uh, told me a similar story of like him playing Hans when he was 12. And he showed me the tactic that Hans pointed out after the game. And that was like, what? It was just like, wow, <laughs> you know, and obviously uh, Greg and Jakob Algard have told similar stories. Now, again, I want to be clear. I'm not condoning Hans's behavior. Uh, he, he lied extensively uh, in, in the press conference. So obviously um, cheating, is his original sin cheating extensively. But if he had not lied so much in that interview, um, I think people might perceive this a lot differently. Um, he was under a lot of pressure. You know, one can construct a narrative where they understand why he wanted to downplay it. Um, but, uh, but that, that did not help him at all. Yeah. And I think, uh, I've noted some people have even 
kind of suggested that, you know, like, like Hans is, is just sort of like a, you know, maybe a 2300 player in disguise or like a 2500 GM, not, you know, not so much that the chess.com report, I think they, like everyone who's looked at this seriously knows that he's a very, um, very strong player, but yeah, I just wanted to, to emphasize the point that I don't think it's a realistic suggestion that Hans is like not a very strong grandmaster. I think everyone who's met him or analyzed with him would say he's an extremely strong, extremely talented grandmaster who has also cheated on occasion, you know, certainly online and an OTB is up for debate, but um, I don't think there's really any serious debate that this guy is incredibly good at chess. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important point. And I also just want to mention, like, um, so chess.com provides a pretty full timeline of his cheating. And one of the things he lied about was he said he did it when he was 16. And it turns out it extended to his being 17, including on his 17th birthday, but then um, against Nepo, as it turns out, but it was Nepo under an anonymous account. Um, but it continued for a month or two after that. So into his 17th year. Um, he cheated. But anyway, I see people saying then he stopped. He got a new account. And as, as I said, this new account, Hans on Twitch on chess.com, he's maintained a 2900 blitz rating. But then that's when his over the board ascent started. So I see some people saying, oh, right when he stopped cheating online, he started rising over the board. But again, I would point to our interview with with uh, my interview with Jakob Bogard. The degree of difficulty of of cheating uh, OTB is significantly stronger. Some might argue the moral transgression is greater. Others seem to disagree. But it's it's just, to me, it's a whole different ball of wax. And also remind listeners, we're only talking about now that Chess.com has issued their report um, and highlighted select tournaments, we're, we're not talking about the majority of his tournaments. We're talking about a minority that are even being questioned. And to me, um, and again, in the broader scope when they compare his performance to other prodigies, which they do do in the report. Um, it's, it doesn't stand out that much. Uh, what did you think of their, um, their overall comparison and their discussion of like the rise of different, uh, different uh, top young talents, Nate? Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Um, they picked out something, some things that um, ab about, Hans's rapid ascent that are, are kind of unusual, but you know, then again, I think we, we know that I think we, everyone sort of knew from the beginning, this guy's had a very rapid ascent um, in some ways, kind of an unusual story for, for, for a chess player who reaches this level, sort of a late bloomer. Um, and then the question is, is it a very rapid ascent of, um, you know, an exceptionally talented player or is it, an impossibly rapid ascent of someone who who's getting unfair assistance. And so they share some things that are sort of suggestive, but really nothing to, to me that, that would be really strong evidence that anything that, that he cheated over the board. Um, you know, like for example, one, one thing there is um, they, they look at his, his progression from 11 years old to 19.25 years old. And, They've got this chart where like even Fisher's on the chart and Hans is, you know, this, he, he, he made the biggest jump. Um, so that's interesting, but I mean, you do have to ask um, some questions about that. One is whenever you see uh, these very specific numbers, like 11 to 19.25 years in a data analysis that are, that seem kind of random and unmotivated, it does make you ask, um, why did you choose that number? Why did you choose those numbers? And um, how much would the results change if you had chosen different numbers? Um, so, you know, you do kind of worry if those could be cherry picked. And I saw an analysis by um, uh, uh, Chess by Numbers, um, Ty Prusimer. Ty Prusimer yeah, who, I, don't, I don't know if he's been on the pod, but he's certainly um, someone who does really good work with um, data analysis. Something he had done earlier where he was kind of, this, this was not related to this chess.com report. It was just work he had done previously about the rise of different prodigies. And he looked at, I think it was like 20, the, the, the fastest time from 2400 to 2650. So getting at the same thing of, of how fast different players have made these big jumps into sort of elite status, uh, that way of looking at things, by far the fastest person to make that particular jump was actually got a camp got a comp steam. So um yeah. you know the point is not anything about got a comp steam. it's just 
this kind of analysis can be very sensitive to the parameters you choose. And if it's not, if it's not robust, if it doesn't show up with a variety of parameters, then you tend to not trust it as much. So um, there's also, there's, there's a, there's something on this was like, I think linear, there's this label on it, like linear extrapolation where required, which I don't know exactly what that means. That's not, that's not really a standard thing you put on a graph. I mean, there's a linear regression is a standard type of model, but linear extrapolation where required, it's not that clear um, what that means in this context. Yeah, and and I agree with your point about the data seem seeming a bit cherry picked. I also felt like it, it again as I mentioned earlier, it seemed a bit far afield of. I appreciate their accounting of the timeline for their actions, and I even uh, appreciate their training their cheat detection team on his OTB games. But in terms of like the the speed of his rise, um, I felt like it was a bit far afield of uh, what what's needed from them. Um, but I will read their conclusions, so um, or one of them. Um, so they say, as set forth, and this is a quote in Table Four. Another key data point that informed our analysis is the fact that there are 13 players currently ranked in the world's top 50 players who are younger than 25. Hans is the only player who became a GM at age 17. The other 12 players all achieved their title between ages 12 and 16. And later on, they go on to say that's considered unusual. Um, sure, it's considered unusual, but we already know we did it. So, like, let's let's look at some data. Um, and then they talk about the, this part. I felt was interesting and possibly important. They talk about the difference between a bimodal and a unimodal distribution and the strength score. The strength score basically being uh, somewhat somehow different than what you would see in like your accuracy after a game on Chess.com, but it is uh, roughly similar from my understanding. But if there were a bimodal distribution. To me, that would, as they say in the report, that would implicate or at least suggest the possibility, greater possibility of guilt, because it would mean sometimes Hans is showing up and playing 3,200 strength, and the rest of the time he's playing 2,500 strength, and as a result, his rating is going up. But they say a player who looks at different times, who plays differently at different times, might show two separate distributions of game strength, which might look more like two lumps bimodal not an even distribution, unimodal. Han's distribution graphs look similar to those of his peers with a fairly simpler, simple and apparently unimodal distributions. And then they show the graphs. Um, so I found that interesting for, for a data nerd like yourself, Nate. That must have been uh, fascinating stuff, whether it belonged in the report or not. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense. Um, you feel that... <laughs> They, they got a lot of pages out of that. There's like, there's like 20 pages of these, uh, these distributions in, uh, in the appendix. But, but at the end of the day, um, they all look pretty similar and, and Hans's does not stand out. So, um, yeah, I guess it, it's an interesting approach. It does make sense. Um, but, uh, in, in this case, once they looked at them, it actually, um, didn't show anything sufficient. I, and I would add that, you kind of, you have to consider the evidence both ways. Meaning, if your thesis is that a player who's cheating would have a bimodal distribution, you look at the guy and he doesn't. You kind of have to acknowledge that that's evidence that he's not cheating, right? I'm not certainly not conclusive evidence, but um, uh, you know what what you don't want to do with data analysis is have a conclusion you want to get and then try things until you get it because that that is not um a valid way to do it and. At, you know, as we've as we've seen with this whole thing, a lot of different people looking at the data in a lot of different ways, they can disagree. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of different ways to slice this stuff. Um, if you are willing to just slice it infinite number of ways until you find what you want, you'll you'll, you'll probably find what you want, but it doesn't prove anything. Well said. Um, so I think we took to Twitter to ask for questions and we got a bunch of good ones that I think we should dive into, but Nate, first we're going to take uh, one more break and, uh, and hear from our sponsors. I've been playing a bit of blitz lately and whenever I'm active online, it's fun to go to aimchess.com and ask their almighty algorithm to give me some insights from my games. It scrapes the sites 
the playing sites automatically and gives you actionable intel. In my case, the real takeaway this time was I got a 7% in resourcefulness in recent games. Um, that's not very good. I need to get better at that. I need to fight harder when I'm losing in a blitz game, look for tricks. And of course, aim chess, as it highlights various aspects of your game, strengths and weaknesses, uh, shows you positions from the game so that you can practice, you can review tactics that you missed uh, and learn lots and a fun way when you review. So please check out aimchess.com. If you decide to subscribe, use the code perpetual30. You can also use the link in the show description to get the same discount 30% off at aimchess.com. And we are back. And following up on the point that Nate just made prior to break, uh, as I discussed last week with uh, Jonathan Rousen, I found uh, the confirmation bias in reaction to last week's noise to be surprising. And it it happened again this week. I was very surprised. I mean, I'll admit I'm trolling Chess Reddit Reddit a lot, following this story very closely, um, obviously, so that I can cover it. But I also just find it fascinating as a sort of uh, mystery. Um, And I was really surprised. Everyone who who thinks Hans cheated seemed to continue to think Hans cheated. And everyone who thinks it's less likely he cheated seemed to... Uh, say, hey, there's no evidence. Whereas others will say, see, he's a liar. He lied more than he admitted. And he's a cheater. He cheated more than he admitted. So I just found it fascinating that no one was really uh, updating their priors. Um, For me, I'll just say I didn't, my prior was he must have not told the whole truth, as you alluded to earlier in his interview, because chess.com had already hinted at it strongly. So my prior in that regard was clearly he didn't hold the whole truth. But my other prior was there's no evidence he's cheated online. And if there is, if he did cheat online, I'd like to see some evidence. OTB you mean, right? Yeah, sorry, OTB. Thank you. Um, and we continue to not see any. But anyway, just a, a repeated word to encourage um listeners to be open-minded to both possibilities um anything to add before we get into the q a uh nate yeah I'm, david Swernan, who who was on the podcast the other day made made an interesting argument on twitter that wherever you started this report should actually make you less less certain because you know if you sort of thought he was clean you found out that he has um that he did cheat more online than he admitted to but but if you thought he was just this you know, constant, unrepentant cheater. Um, well, they they looked pretty deeply into his OTB track record, and ultimately, their conclusion was there's there's not really strong evidence he's cheated OTB. So that 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 was how David Spurden said you should update your beliefs. Says <laughs> does not seem to be how most people. It seems like in practice, like you said, most people kind of doubled down on what they already believed. Yeah, and actually, uh, the the episode last week with uh, Grandmaster Jonathan Rousen and David Smerdin was was quite popular. Uh, they're both brilliant, uh, incisive thinkers, so I'm not surprised, and uh, I appreciate that that everyone found them insightful. So I actually want to read because not everyone's on Twitter. I want to read what what David Smerdin uh, wrote because he kind of did a uh, you know ten sentence summary of how he updates this belief, some of which uh, Nate just alluded to. So David, and this is all a quote, said, my take on chess.com's not Hans Niemann report, a thread. Uh, The report is good. It didn't need to be that long for the Hans Niemann case. Um, But on the other hand, it's great that chess.com has publicly laid out more details about its cheat detection system, the human process behind detection, banning policies, and their broader policy towards cheating. Unfortunately, the results of their analysis are not what the chess world wanted to hear, which is not their fault, because it means we're unlikely to ever get a resolution on whether Hans cheated over the board. Um, Super short summary. One, he cheated much more online than we knew, including up to age 17 and in money events. Yes, I should have mentioned that earlier. Two, no evidence of Sinkfield Cup cheating. Three, weak evidence that Hans OTB rise is suspicious, but nothing concrete regarding cheating. Unfortunately, the the chess.com shifts the probability that Hans cheated OTB towards 50%, no matter which side you started on. Uh, For what it's worth, I and others had prior beliefs around 10 to 20%, uh, while extreme other ends include others with 80%. Going, by the way, I I disagree with that personally, but anyway, going forward, what new information could bring about the unlikely event of a resolution? I see two possibilities. 
one, Hans confesses or concrete physical evidence of OTB cheating is revealed. Two, Hans continues his OTB tra trajectory towards 2750 plus and events with super strict anti-cheating standards. Given that both are unlikely, we probably won't get a resolution. Hans will continue to play under a cloud. Magnus will not feel vindicated and organized will be face organizers will be faced with an invitational dilemma. Not a good outcome for chess, but on the other hand, very good that the issue of cheating is in the spotlight and major chess orgs seem ready to work together to fix things. Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel like it should, as I alluded to, it should make people who didn't think he cheated online consider it more likely because to me, it, it was one of the last sort of um, unheard from data points. We'd heard from Magnus, we'd heard from Hans, and we were waiting to hear more from chess.com. So, and obviously I would, you know, I respect their cheat detection team. So if they had said, this is extremely suspicious, I would have respected that, but that's, that's not what they said. So anyway, to me, that was the only thing I took issue with, yeah, although it, I've, it, it, it seemed to be um, more another nail in the coffin of the idea that we might get some very concrete evidence that he cheated at Sinkfield cup uh, specifically, right? Because, because when Carlson suddenly withdrew, the initial thought was, wow, that's an extreme action. He wouldn't do that unless, you know, there was a really good reason to believe Hans cheated in that particular game or in that particular tournament. Um, I think it, at this point, it seems pretty clear that that type of evidence is not going to be coming from anyone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're sort of out of, <laughs> out of people who could come with it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Ken one, Regan. one more story about Hans, you know, so, so the only, when, when Carlson did his, his follow-up statement, just pretty much the only thing he said was that Hans was too um, relaxed at the board or like right. usually relaxed. I, I just, that, that made me remember one other experience, which was at um, us amateur team East, which I think we've both played in. Uh, I, I remember one time I, I like to walk around and look at the other boards during my game. I, I saw one game where Hans was playing for his team. His, I, you know, I, I watched, I looked at this board. His opponent was deep in the tank. I looked at the positions. His opponent's just totally busted. He's getting checkmated. You know, he probably should probably just go ahead and resign, but he's really thinking to try to get out of it. And I look over at Hans and he is like slumped back in his chair, like dead asleep. So, um, <laughs> You know, I just I just thought of that when Magnus raised this thing of um, Hans was too relaxed. Of um, you know, Hans, Hans is kind of he's, he's he's a confident guy, maybe at times a cocky guy. Um, it, he's clearly um, rubbed people the wrong way, and I think that's a big part of this. Um, you know, he sort of has a board presence that is is kind of unusual. Um, Magnus interpreted that as he must be cheating. I think maybe he's just kind of an unusual guy, which, you know, a lot of chess players are kind of weird guys. So um, I don't know. Yeah. Anyone who, who heard my, my March 2022 interview with him will, will not dispute that he's an unusual guy, but, uh, but yeah, uh, we're, works very hard on his chess. And, uh, and yeah, again, I've, I've certainly heard reports of air quotes, rude behavior at the board, but uh but that doesn't mean that he's cheating. Okay. On to the, um, the questions from Twitter. This one is from friend of the pod, Evan Rosenberg. Evan seemed quite um, arguing with a lot of people, uh, quite um, quite sort of angry about the way that Hans has been treated, which, uh, you know, again, he's not a saint. He shouldn't have lied, but I, I sympathize with Evan. Anyway, he says, shouldn't the only meaningful question to be whether be whether Hans cheated against Magnus in the Sinkfield Cup? And to that extent, doesn't the chess.com report only serve to obfuscate the truth? Well, I would say, um, you know, I I don't think it's the only meaningful question. I think chess.com is privy to a lot of information about what happens on their platform uh, uh, that the rest of us don't have. And, you know, and they revealed some of that that showed that Hans's description of it in, the, in that famous interview was not really accurate. So I think that part of it was was relevant. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I felt like obviously that that is what started this all um and everything stems from magnus making this accusation but um if hans cheated otb in particular um to me it's a mitigating factor in explaining magnus's behavior although as others have said uh even if hans cheated in that game i don't feel that 
this was the proper way for Magnus to uh, to reply. I mean, uh, okay. Next question: Do we think that Hans will continue to get invites to top tournaments? From Camila Gomez. Shout out to Camila. Yeah, it's it's a good question. I'm probably not the best guy to answer it because, you know, I'm a lowly FM. I'm not a super GM. I'm not um, not really in the loop of, of how these elite uh, invitations get handed out. I guess I would think, um, well, for, for, for any tournament that Magnus is um, going to be participating in, it seems like it would be very hard for an organizer to invite invite both Magnus and Hans to the same small invitational event. That would just be sort of asking for trouble. And also, and they can kind of justify that because as, as steep as Hans's rise has been, he's still only number 49 in the latest rating list. Um, I mean, I say only that's pretty strong, but it's not, it's not like he is so entrenched in the top few players in the world. You, you have to invite him to, to an elite tournament. You can just say, well, you know, we invited some other top guys. Um, so I, I guess maybe I don't, I, I would expect he maybe will not get as many invitations to like the very elite tournaments. But um, on the other hand, if you're an organizer who, who wants some interest in your event, um, well, this guy is a spark plug for, for like all the interest in the chess world right now. Yeah. Similar caveat that I, I'm not uh, talking to organizers all the time, but I had the same reaction. It seems like he's less likely to get invites to tournaments with Magnus in it. And he's, he may be more likely. I don't think he's less likely to get invites to other tournaments and there are still the open tournaments. I mean, he's starting to get slightly strong for um, the, the majority of them. Um, so there, once you reach top 20 in the world or so, you don't see players going to a lot of the smaller open tournaments, but you know, there's the Gibraltar's and Isles of Isles of man and so on and so forth. Um, so he may have to play in more of those. And, and I do have to say, it, it bothers me. Um, it bothers me that there's no evidence that he cheated. Like, okay, he cheated online, but um, four out of 100, chess.com reported, four out of, a, of the top 100 players in the world um, cheated on their, their server um, and dozens of grandmasters. And Hans is the one being singled out. So, uh, it, yeah, again, it's, I'm not saying he's a great guy. I don't, I don't really know him. But uh, he's not being treated the same as as everyone else. Yeah, and I would say that's that's one thing that has stood out to me. Of um, a lot of a lot of other grandmasters have backed up Magnus Carlsen and said, you know, he's handling this right. Um, he's I would have done the same thing. Um, I think there's there's two things that are getting mixed up here. One is is cheating a really big issue and should it be addressed? Two is did Magnus address it in the right way? And I would say, you know. Clearly, cheating is a big issue. Um, it's sort of been festering under the surface, surface. A lot of grandmasters have been frustrated about it. So in that sense, it's good that we kind of blew the lid off this thing. But um, when when you're talking about dealing with cheating and fair play, like it's important that there's a process and that everything happens fairly. So I don't really see any way that... that with you know suddenly withdrawing from a tournament after you lose a game but there's really no evidence of foul play um i just don't see how that is an appropriate way to handle things yeah i agree and chess.com has suggested that they're going to move towards more transparency going forward so i i appreciate that um but again i feel like we could have moved in that direction without uh magnus yeah uh, taking no, another interesting facet report they see they kind of floated the possibility of moving towards more transparency but one uh big question that a lot of people had is are they going to name names apart from hans the answer so far at least is no you know they they point out in this report four four players in the top 100 many many gms but they don't name any of them so yeah i i agree with you i'm a little confused as to why Han seems to be getting quite a different treatment than anyone else. Yeah. Um, and they seemed quite bothered that Hans um, went public with their re banning. They mentioned it several times um, in, in the report. Um, I don't 
like it was going to come out in pretty short order because it's obviously public who's playing in the global chess championship. So I did, uh, I understand that previously their communications have been private. They, in a sense, did him a favor by keeping all of his prior transgressions private. So I, I get that uh, I, I can somewhat understand being upset that he shared that, but it would have been known very soon anyway. So, um, yeah, just 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 a minor point to uh, to highlight. Um, let's get to another question. This one is from Latano, and Latano asks: Is it fair to say that current physical anti cheat is vulnerable to modern attacks? A and B. Statistical analysis is insufficiently sensitive to detect detect strong players who consult engines sparingly. If so, what standards can we use to evaluate the odds of anyone cheating? Very good questions. Yeah, really good question. Again, I have to admit that I'm probably not not a great person to answer, at least the, the first part of it. I'm not really, I don't know a lot about the sort of hardware one could use to cheat and how detectable it is. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll pass on that one. As far as the statistical analysis, yeah, I think, I think this gets at something really important, which is basically, it's, it's really hard to catch someone with statistical analysis alone, because the nature of, of statistics is you can have a low probability of something, but um, low probability events do happen. So it's, it's really hard. To, it's hard to just nail someone with this um, unless they're pretty egregious. Um, you know, the, the more they do it and um, you, you can kind of get into a probability zone where where you can say with a very high degree of certainty, they cheated, but um, for sophisticated players who who use this stuff in a clever way, it's it is tough to catch them. So I think for that reason, the sort of forensic evidence of you know smoking gun type stuff of you know you find a device in their shoe or you have video footage of them looking at their phone, that's you really kind of would would want to have that to really nail it down in many cases. Yeah, well said. And just on the physical side, I just want to reiterate, we can implement common sense measures, 30 minute delay, um, check your phones at the door, zero tolerance for any electronic device. Um, but I do feel that to the extent that people are talking about all of these sort of James Bond contraptions, there's only so much you can do right now in an open tournament. And I do just, again, want to fall back on, you know, it's a Innocent until proven guilty is a bedrock of our society. Um, so, and being guilty of lying and cheating online does not mean you're guilty of uh, of cheating OTB. So uh, we're in the unfortunate state where we have to give people, all people, the benefit of the the doubt. Um, and that does that's why this is that's why this story has been so big. Obviously, we're seeing. A similar story unfold in the in the poker world, where this this intersection of uh, as as Jonathan Rousen so eloquently discussed last week, uh, this this Ill this intersection of uh, technology and um, competitions is creating new problems that we haven't fully solved yet. Yeah, I think the the poker probably we, we won't get into the the poker story because that's kind of not what we're talking about. But it does it does seem indicative of some higher level of anxiety and awareness of the possibility of using technology to cheat. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And okay. Next question from Zach Haskins asks, uh, when players have been caught cheating in OTB events, it has resulted in OTB pen penalties like Sebastian Feller, the, the guy who cheated at the, uh, the, the Olympiad, the, the French player, when a player is caught cheating online, they suffer online consequences. Regardless of whether Hans is proven guilty or not in cheating OTB, should online cheating result in consequences in OTB com competitions or vice versa? If yes, what are appropriate consequences? Yeah, so I, I would say the status quo currently is is that it clearly hasn't, um, except, except sort of, you know, maybe in, in this case, uh, because, because again, we know chess.com has said they, they've caught all these GMs cheating online. Um, in general, I don't think there have been repercussions for those GMs over the board. Um, should there be, I'm kind of on the fence on that one. It's, it's, it's a tricky question. Um, you know, you can make the case 
cheating is cheating. Um, that and and I, I guess I my main thought is just that that would that would be quite a different world to the one we're living in right now. You could you could see um, online and over the board chess being kind of more unified than they are right now. Um, in this report, chess.com seems to be taking a step in that direction in the sense that they are throwing their hat in the ring when it comes to this OTB cheating data analysis. Um, but at present, um, the online and OTB chess worlds are, are still pretty separate, I would say. Yeah. Again, this is one where I do think we're going to move in, in that direction. And um, it's, it's tricky because uh, chess.com previously, I, I understand why they've used the system they have where they haven't outed people and they have given them the, the option to return because they are at least 99. When they catch someone, they're at least 99% sure, I would say, based on their evidence. But once you're getting to publicly shaming someone and um, making them unable to earn a living as a chess professional um, based on outing them, uh, you know, is 99% enough? I, I don't know. Um, so it's it's a very difficult question. But um, uh, I think that we inevitably have to find a way to move in the direction of, of more transparency. Again, even knowing that we don't we don't have all the answers figured out at this point. It's an unenviable task. And again, I do, I'm not, haven't been, uh, there's some things that I think chess.com handled better than others, but I'm overall extremely sympathetic to the fact that they're just trying to have a chess site. <laughs> you know, they're just trying to promote the game and, uh, and people cheating are just creating these immense problems and immense expenses for their company. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so Benji Porto, friend of the pod, also has a data science background, uh, also suggested one other online, um, online or rather uh, OTB cheating detection possibility of like hiring someone to try to cheat at events, hiring a top player um, to see if he could get away with it as a way to increase security. Um, I do think stuff like that's a good idea, but uh, a lot of these events, the budget is not unlimited. So again, there's there's a lot of problems, but it's certainly I know that uh, chess.com has floated ideas like that with their online detection in the past. And it's, I think it's a lot easier to test online, but uh, it's not a bad idea to unknowingly have someone try to cheat. But if it's a top open event right now, I have a feeling that the sad truth is we wouldn't be able to detect them. Um, as Grandmaster Alex Fishbein said a few weeks ago, chess has always been based on the honor system. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a sad day if we're moving away from that. Yeah, th this idea of, you know, the, so, the so-called um, red team, you know, you hire someone to cheat and then they, a as part of your anti-cheating effort. Um, I like this sort of James Bond aspect of it. I'm not sure. I have some reservations about it because if you imagine you're playing in an OTB tournament and you're playing against someone who cheated, even if you later find out that they were part of this kind of anti-cheating project and you get your rating points back or whatever, um, I think just the the experience of, of playing against someone who's cheating is, is quite unsettling or even the suspicion. I think we saw that with with Magnus's game against um, uh, Hans, where, where he lost in the Singfield Cup, of believing your opponent is cheating or could be cheating already is likely to make your per performance a lot worse because you doubt yourself. You know, if, if your opponent really has access to the computer, then any line you can calculate, like if you calculate what looks like a winning line, then you go back and you go, well, it can't be winning because computer would never allow it. So that can be really damaging. And I just think um, if you have, if, if players have this possibility in the back of their mind, I could be playing against someone who's cheating. Um, even if they're doing it for, for a positive reason, it, it's unsettling for, for your thought process at the board. Um, I guess, I guess the counter argument to that would be a lot of players already have that in the back of their mind. Cause it's really not being addressed adequately. A lot of people would say. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you use a, a quote red team, a cheating team within a tournament, um, like in online, you can do it because you can do it in casual games. Um, but in a tournament, 
you're they're playing people they're beating people exactly. they're ruining the, yeah. they're ruining yeah the they're really for... impacting so yeah it's it, it comes with the cost of you kind of ruin the tournament if you do this but you yeah. have to presumably pay a team to actually do this which you know most chess tournaments i don't know if they have a lot of like spare cash for these kind of efforts yeah and then benji had also just sent in a couple questions that were basically uh designed to in you encourage listeners again to to think probabilistically to um i i feel like uh for, from the feedback i've gotten from recent podcasts i do think that a lot of the people uh listening shout out <laughs> to everyone listening um i i do get the sense that uh the listeners have been less prone to jumping to conclusions than some of the people consuming some of the other online content but again just have to reiterate no one knows what happened so whichever you know whatever your subjective probability is um i hope it doesn't err on the side of certainty in either direction um i think that's about it uh it's um i'm yeah i'm i'm a little uh despondent i have to say how are you feeling nate, nate? yeah i think um having having read it last night and then sort of slept on it and talking now i guess um my overall feeling is we kind of ended up not not exactly where we started but close to um you know it, it could have gone different ways like if they if they had come out and said we know for sure that hans has been cheating rampantly upline up to the present, you know, up to a month. Ago, yeah, that would be one thing. If they came out and you know had some kind of blockbuster report of, we are very, very confident Hans has cheated OTB, and here's why. That would have been big news. Um, I think at the end of the day, the 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 report was maybe the sort of the most probable thing that that you would have expected, and kind of left things near their current state, which is everything is just up in the air and there's still a lot of tension because Hans did cheat online more than he admitted to, it seems, um, in significant ways, but um, not, you know, not completely overwhelming ways up to the present. And they, they kind of turned over a lot of stones with his over the board history and basically found nothing conclusive. So, so I think we're kind of almost back where we started of he's got this, this track record of cheating online. That's, I mean, it's not great as, as someone who plays online a lot. I don't like, I don't like it. It kind of put, put a lot of doubt in my mind when I play online, but at the same time, we already knew that it seems to, as far as we can tell, the most recent case seems to be 2020. And um, as far as over the board, there's still, there's still suspicion lingering, but really nothing any, nothing close to conclusive evidence that he's done that. So um, it's looking, you know, as, as more and more of these stones drop, it's, it's looking less likely that we're going to get the satisfying resolution to this, that, that we kind of wanted. Yeah. You summed up my feelings very well too. And getting back to Camila's question about uh, whether it would impact his future, um, invitations to tournaments i want to be clear that my my personal opinion is based on this um lack of new evidence i do not think it should impact his inv invitations um magnus needs I, I mean magnus needs to come out with more than he has in order to ruin this kid's career in, in my opinion and i find the whole uh I wish I would like to say more Go, going back to Magnus's statement from last week. I would like to say more, but I would need legal permission from Hans. Like that statement to me is quite odd. Are there legal proceedings underway? Like uh, it's, it's not clear to me exactly why he would, he would need legal permission to say more. Yeah. That one was confused. I, I had a tweet about this too, but that was a weird one. Um, for me as well, because what what is Hans supposed to do? Just sort of go up on a mountaintop and yell, Magnus Carlsen can say whatever messed up shit he wants about me, you know, and I won't sue him. Like, why would anyone do that? And like, would that, would that even carry water legally? It's just an odd suggestion um, because 
Well, it's it's kind of either way. If if you if you believe Hans is is a bu- much bigger cheater than he's admitted to, and he's just this this terrible guy, then why would he give anyone permission to out him? But then again, if you believe he's innocent, then from his perspective, um, Magnus Carlsen is kind of smearing him unfairly. So so again, why would he give permission to him? So just the whole the suggestion is is pretty odd, I would say. Yeah. And one other thing I want to mention is someone did message me who said, um, uh, a streamer, but I didn't ask if I could quote them, so I'm not going to, but they, they thought that, um, they thought that Hans cheated over the board, but they strongly believed in innocent till proven guilty. So they felt like he should not be facing, um, punishment with the current state of information. And again, I don't think this was last week, but I don't think the chess.com report has uh, produced more evidence of uh, OTB cheating. And I think that's an admirable stance. I, I think it's reasonable to think that Hans cheated OTB. There are some some suspicious performances. Uh, he's not uh, trustworthy. Um, but I don't think it's reasonable to be so sure that you're ready to punish him um, given the information that we have. Um, and yeah, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but I just, I feel kind of strongly about this. Yeah. And it does seem that the process and the standards that have been applied to Hans seem to be very, very different than everyone else who has a track record of cheating online. And I don't know if I've ever, if I really heard a good reason for why that's the case. Well said. Um, so I think maybe we can leave it there, Nate. Um, thanks to everyone for, for listening and, um, Nate, we'll plug your book in a sec, but also want to say as for the bonus pods, I have a feeling this might be the last major news thing for a while, as I mentioned earlier. So if, if that's the case, then I'll be transitioning back to once a week pods for the most part. And obviously this will be continue to be discussed, but at a slower rate, but if if new stuff does come out, if there's a smoking gun that emerges or Magnus reveals some more information, uh, I will continue to cover it in a timely fashion. But I just, it's possible that won't happen. But anyway, evaluate like a grandmaster. Let's move on to rosier topics, Nate. Yeah. So this is, I mean, this is back to very. This this book is not about cheating. It's it's not even about data. It's a it's a chess improvement strategy book um, that I've been working on with um, Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, who's my co-author. Um, I am wrapping it up this week. I know I keep saying this. My first book turns out those last few edits on a book are a giant pain, but I am um, doing the final edit. So should be should be actually available within a week or two. Um, so people can, you know, if you follow my Twitter or you follow my newsletters, Wish and Zug, um, I'll definitely be be blasting it out when it's when it's available. So um, yeah, if people are, if people are just looking to get, get away from all this drama and work on their chess, uh, that that'll be coming out soon. Yeah, I certainly need to get back to that personally. I'm getting worse every day, and uh, yeah, this this drama is not helping it. Um, and and yeah, I did want to um, plug Nate's newsletter one more time. He puts pours his heart into it, uh, and it's free. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll link to that as well. Highly recommend that, uh, the listeners subscribe. All right. Thank you, Nate. Much appreciated. And, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.